So, that gave us a new mission. Let's give it a quick look here. And you'll notice, it's this one right here, Garrus, find Dr. Salian. Garrus told you about his encounter with Dr. Salian, the geneticist. He regrets letting him escape the first time and hopes that you'll be able to track him down and bring him to justice. We need to head to the coordinates that he just gave us. Garrus gave the coordinates of Dr. Salian's last known whereabouts. Head to the Herschel system in the Kepler Verge, which I'm actually not sure we had yet gotten access to. That's one of the things that uh, will occasionally happen, is that there are actually uh, some systems that we have not yet learned about, or have not yet had any quests in, and therefore they just do not show up at all on our galaxy map, and only once we do start to get some missions there do they suddenly appear there. So we may or may not have had the Kepler Verge previously, uh, but now that we have this mission from Garrus, obviously we do at this stage. And so the other thing is that obviously this says Garrus at the beginning, rather than what we'll often see, the UNCs for uh, Uncharted World or Citadel, if it's purely on the Citadel or largely based on the Citadel. And uh, well, this is a totally different category of quests or subcategory of quests, I suppose you could say. And that this is basically, I hesitate to say the word loyalty mission, or the phrase loyalty mission, but it is functionally uh, just about that, in that it is of particular importance to Garrus that we make sure this happens. And uh, like you said, particular importance that we bring Garrus with us when we do it. So uh, this is absolutely a mission that even if you find yourself saying, I don't really want to hundred percent this game i just want to do the important missions and and uh you know get the the gist of it make sure you do this mission this one is important so that was one of the reasons why i wanted to make sure we took the chance to talk to some more people um let's talk to tally next i think we did chat with her a lot recently so she may not have much if anything new to say to us but just to see Shepard, I'm glad you're here. Oh, uh, you feeling better? Good to see you smiling again, so to speak. <laughs> I'm oh, with the mask? Much better now. Yeah, she's having I some trouble before. I'm used to how quiet your ship is. I still think a lot about my pilgrimage, though. I know Starin's our top priority, but with all the worlds we go to, I was hoping to find something to bring back to the flotilla. You will. You will. I mean, we've got a lot of stuff to do remaining here, so uh, I'm sure you'll find something. We've still got a long way to go. You'll find something to take back. Yes, but it cannot just be some derelict ship my people can use for salvage. It has to be more than that. There's a lot expected of me. Oh? Why is that? What's so special about you? It's my father. He's the senior member of the Admiralty Board. He's one of the mm -hmm. people who can overrule the decisions of the Conclave for the good of the migrant fleet. My father is responsible for the lives of 17 million people. Our entire race is in his hands, and I'm his only child. Oh, so you're like, kind of sort of royalty. So are you some kind of heir to the Quarian throne or something? No, it doesn't work that way. My father's position isn't hereditary. I'll probably never serve on the Admiralty board myself. Officially, I'm just the same as any other citizen, but it doesn't work that way in practice. People have always treated me differently because of who my father is. Hmm. Say differently? You mean that in a preferential treatment way? Because, I mean, in this case, it sounds like it's actually detrimental, at least putting additional responsibility on your shoulders. You must get all kinds of special privileges. I probably had it easier than most growing up, but it's not all good. People like my father have enemies. And they're not above using me to get to him. Ah, uh, yeah, that does put some extra pressure on you. I can see that being the case, for sure. It must be tough on you. My people place a high value on family and ancestry. There's an unspoken expectation that I'll live up to my father's example. Everyone's waiting for me to do something great on my pilgrimage. Something that will forever change our lives for the better. Yeah, that is a lot of pressure. If I don't, it's like I failed. And that reflects badly on both me and my father. 
Yeah. Um, that is a lot of pressure. But what if, say, we, I don't know, just, like, save the galaxy, maybe? The work you're doing here is more important than anything any Quarian has ever done before. Yes, I know. But you have to understand Quarian culture. We're a very insular society. The events beyond the flotilla don't much matter to the average citizen. Our greatest dream is that one day, we'll return to our homeworld and drive out again. But even if we stop Saren, that's not going to happen. There's still yeah. millions of Geth behind the veil. Oh. Until they're gone, our exile will continue. So, uh, in that case, if not stopping Saren, what is the answer? What would you need to bring back to make everyone happy? Something that would help us better understand the Geth. They've changed significantly since the exile. They've continued to evolve. We've done our best to study them, but it's not easy. They're very reclusive. Until recently, they never went beyond the borders of the Vale. And all the Geth we run into now are under Saren's control. We'd need to find Geth operating on their own, independently. But I don't want this to get in the way of our mission, Shepard. First, we stop Saren. Then I'll worry about my own problems. Hmm. Okay. Very interesting. So, above and beyond that, we've already learned about Corian's Geth and Pilgrimage from Tally. But we may be able to learn more about, more about her father. What was your father like? It wasn't easy growing up as the daughter of one of the Admiralty. Even before he joined the board, he was a prominent figure. People looked to him for leadership. He had to set an example, and he expected the same of his daughter. Plus, he was pretty strict, a military man through and through. He never allowed me to settle for anything less than excellence. As a kid, I sometimes felt like he was pushing me too hard. But now, I'm old enough to appreciate what he taught me. The world doesn't owe us anything. If we want something in life, we have to earn it. Hmm. Uh... Are you close to your father? It sounds like, you know, there's some tension there, as you were saying. He, uh, he did put a lot of pressure on you to, to perform at your best. But now, years later, it seems like you've come to appreciate that he did that. Sounds like a tough upbringing. You don't resent your father at all? Like I said, it wasn't easy. My father's not the kind of person you bond with. And he wasn't around all that much. Too busy. Mm. People counted on him, and he took his duties seriously. Even when he was around, he always seemed a bit distant. Like his mind was always somewhere else. Come to think of it, I can't ever remember seeing him smile. Not once. It's like he was always weighed down by all that responsibility. I mean, was he always wearing his I mask, mean, though? I know he cares about me, but he never really showed it, not in the usual way. I guess the best thing I can say about my father is that I respect him. Ooh. That's a family member. Note how she said, she did, she did not say love. She said respect, as if he was just... A, a figure, a public figure, that she, well, yes, respects, but uh, not someone that she feels like she has much of a personal tie to, like an actual family member. But what about your mother? Where was your mother in all this? Mother was around, but she always seemed to kind of blend into the background. Almost like she was overshadowed by my father. He tends to do that to people. She passed on about five years ago, some airborne virus that swept through the fleet happens sometimes when the filters start to break down. I think my father took it pretty hard. After she was gone, he became even more focused on his work. I think that was his way of dealing with the grief. Hmm. Yeah, that is tough. Um, yeah, that's a lot of personal talk, though. Maybe we just change subjects here. I want here. to talk about something else. Like what? Uh, and based on how we asked you about all this stuff, by something else, I mean, like, I should go. I should go. See you later. Okay. So, we actually did get a lot of codex entries from that as well, or at least one. And we also will have to keep in mind trying to find some kind of get technology or information that might be helpful for Tally to bring back to the migrant fleet for her pilgrimage. 
And also, speaking of codex entries, have this core charge status we can examine. For more of those. Anything else here? I don't think we're gonna have much of anything new to chat with Engineer Adams about here. Speaking of codex entries, it has been a long time. I mean, a long time since we last did any of those. So, uh, probably worth doing a little bit just to catch ourselves up to speed. I'm thinking, do you have any, yeah, primary ones? Those tend to be the priority. So, what if we go, what do we have for non sapient creatures? After the Geth secure a location, they round up and impale dead and living bodies on mechanical spikes. The spikes rapidly transform may have already known about this. into withered husks, extracting water and trace minerals. I think we did. Replacing them I'm going to bump us down here. Thresher maws I'm guessing are this is Thresher maws that's carnivores new. Carnivores that spend their entire lives eating or searching for something to eat. Threshers reproduce via spores that can lie dormant for millennia, yet are robust enough to survive prolonged periods in deep space and atmospheric re-entry. As a result, Thresher spores appear on many worlds, spread by previous generations of space travelers. The body of a thresher never entirely leaves the ground. Only the head and tentacles erupt from the Earth to attack. In addition to physical attacks, threshers have the ability to project toxic chemicals and emit bursts of infrasound as a shockwave weapon. The Alliance first encountered threshers on the colony of Akuz in 2177. After contact was lost with the Pioneer team, Marine units were deployed to investigate. The shore parties were set upon by hungry threshers, and nearly the entire assault force was killed. Alliance forces recommend engaging threshers with vehicle-mounted heavy weapons. Yeah, so uh, we've encountered a few of those thresher maws as of late, and uh, as the entry here does suggest, they can be quite a potent enemy. After the Geth Let's see, what else can we learn about here that is new and relevant to us? The Citadel. I think we've learned about the Citadel, but Citadel, Citadel space. space is an unofficial term referring to any region of space controlled by a species that acknowledges the authority of the Citadel Council. At first glance, it appears this territory encompasses most of the galaxy. In reality, however, less than 1% of the stars have been explored. Even Mass Effect FTL Drive is slow relative to the volume of the galaxy. Empty space and systems without suitable drive discharge sites are barriers to exploration. Only the mass relays allow ships to jump hundreds of light years in an instant, the key to expanding across an otherwise impassable galaxy. Whenever a new relay is activated, the destination system is rapidly developed. From that hub, FTL drive is used to expand to nearby star clusters. The result is a number of densely developed clusters, thinly spread across the vast expanse of space, connected by the mass relay network. And that's sort of what we tend to see, right? Is that we have things like the Serpent Nebula, where there's just the Citadel and not really much else, then use a uh, mass relay to travel quite a distance to say, the uh, local cluster, which is, or yeah, the local cluster, which is where Earth and uh, Sol solar system exists, but uh, that's quite a distance. And then from there, you could use a mass relay to say go to the uh, what was it, Hades Gamma cluster or Artemis Tau cluster, which are the places where we were previously. But uh, because those uh, those mass effect relays, those mass relays have very specific destinations and you don't change where those destinations are they are fixed there's a uh, not a lot of flexibility there you can travel a very long distance very quickly by going through the mass relays but if you want to go anywhere else you basically just take a mass relay to get as close as possible and then you're stuck driving your spaceship the rest of the distance which is considerably slower and like it was saying in the entry, depending on if you have places to dump your waste uh, fuel, Citadel you may not be able to make that work. Agent. Let's see. Let's, uh, let's maybe do one or two more here. What about... What could be... A humanity and Systems Alliance, I feel like, is usually quite relevant, because that's just humans. 
the home world and capital of humanity is entering a new golden age. The resource wealth of a dozen settled colonies and a hundred industrial outposts flows back to Earth, fueling great works of industry, commerce, and art. The great cities are greening as arcology skyscrapers and telecommuting allow more efficient use of land. Earth is still divided among nation states, though all are affiliated beneath the overarching banner of the Systems Alliance. While every human enjoys a longer and better life than ever, the gap between rich and poor widens daily. Advanced nations have eliminated most genetic disease and pollution. Less fortunate regions have not progressed beyond 20th century technology and are often smog-choked, overpopulated slums. Sea levels have risen two meters in the last 200 years, and violent weather is common due to environmental damage inflicted during the late 21st century. The past few decades, however, have seen significant improvement due to recent technological advances. Uh, can you tell us what those technological advances were? That'd be quite helpful. Uh, anyways, the then uh, are... that appears to the be the last from that section, <laughs> which is, I mean, since we just went to the local cluster, that's probably why. Then, what else can we learn about, hmm. How about yeah? Let's let's try plants and locations. Pharaoh, no, uh, Pharos is a habitable world. Yeah, so Pharos and Novaria are two cluster. places we're gonna go for the main quest two later on. Two thirds of the habitable surface is covered with the ruins of a crumbling Prothean megatropolis. In the millennia since the Prothean extinction, the ruins have been repeatedly picked over by looters many times. Pharos was considered a poor prospect for colonization, as little open ground remains for agriculture. The only sizable freshwater sources are the poles, which are tapped by the decaying Prothean aqueduct systems. The dead cities, while in good condition considering their antiquity, are of uncertain stability. Ground level is congested by a dozen meters of fallen debris, and the air is fouled by dust. In 2178, the Human Exogeny Corporation announced its intention to place a permanent colony on Pharos to thoroughly explore the ruins. The pioneer settlement was placed on the upper levels of several intact skyscrapers, using the surviving Prothean aqueducts and rooftop hydroponic gardens to support the population. Yes, yeah, so that's that's one of the two places we've learned about that we want to check for signs of Saren, the other being Novaria. Novaria is a cool, rocky world with most of its hydrosphere locked up in massive glaciers. A privately chartered colony world, the planet is owned by the Novaria Development Corporation Holding Company. The NDC is funded by investment capital from two dozen high technology development firms and administrated by an executive board representing their interests. The investors built remote hot labs in isolated locations across Novaria's surface. These facilities are used for research too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere, as Novaria is technically not part of Citadel space and therefore exempt from Council law. By special arrangement, Citadel special tactics and reconnaissance agents have been granted extraterritorial privileges, but it remains to be seen how committed the executive board is to that principle. Given its unique situation, it is understandable that Novaria is often implicated in all manner of wild conspiracy theories. <laughs> Including, but not limited to, questions about how and why Saren is perhaps trying to take over the galaxy? Uncharted there are between worlds. two and four hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and less than one percent of them have ever been visited or had their systems properly surveyed. And that's crazy. Humanity's early expansion into the Attican Traverse was haphazard. A desperate race to claim habitable planets where populations can be economically settled. Ignored in the wake of this land grab were thousands of less hospitable worlds, each potentially rich with industrial resources. The wealth of entire solar systems lies untapped waiting for corporate survey teams or independent pioneers to discover and exploit them. However, this is not an easy task. In addition to the environmental hazards, the fact that uncharted worlds are largely ignored makes them popular bases for criminals, revolutionaries, cults, and others who wish to remain unnoticed by galactic society. And that's a very interesting point there. 
that, uh, I mean, we already have run into some of those types of things. But with some of the bandits we've encountered and those scientists that apparently turned cultists and then turned into the husks that we fought. Uh, so, yeah, lots of things can go terribly wrong on Uncharted Worlds, it would seem. Pharaoh Sizzik. Okay. There are certainly more things we can check out here between ships and vehicles, weapons, armor, and equipment, and what have you. But I think in the interest of not, you know, doing a crazy lore dump now, it just, it had been a while, so felt like it was a good time for us to throw in a little bit here. Okay, and uh, one other person that uh, we've not yet tried to talk to would be Ashley. Do you have anything else uh, for us to ask you about? I mean, similarly to Caden, you kind of have this generic how are we doing question that we can basically always ask you, which for the most part I think is, again, going to be a reflection on our most recent main quest. Maybe with the occasional exception. We can try it. What's your opinion on the last mission? Not sure I buy Dr. Tassoni's yeah. story. Yeah, so to clarify, this is referring to the last the main program. quest, not side quest we did. You're saying, you have your doubts that uh, Liara... I mean, well, there was some worry, some suspicion that Liara, being the daughter of uh, Matriarch Benezia, Matriarch Benezia who is working with Saren, might mean that Liara is also implicated. She's also involved in helping Saren. She's evil, if you will. But, uh, I mean, she denied it and seems to thus far have been just helping us out. But Ashley is still expressing some questions as to whether or not that should be the case. But I think she's given us no reason not to believe her. I think she's being straight with us. Or at least, I don't think she lied very often. Yeah, she's probably really bad at it. Too bad those okay. robots got destroyed. I mean, they lasted thousands of years. That's impressive. Yeah, so I, there's a chance we've already asked you about that, because of course, this is not the... Or I, I imagine we talked to you after we did that mission. But, uh, can we talk about other stuff? Now, of course, like I believe I was saying before, Ashley and Liara... Both potential romance options in Mass Effect 1, so you do shoot the breeze, you know, chat a lot with Ashley, then you will find yourself in a romance position with her, whether that is something that you wanted or not, so bear that in mind. Do you have a few minutes to talk one-on-one? -on -one? Sure. I was just watching some mail from home. Oh, before I go, we saw Caden in a news vid about the Normandy. He's cute. Later, sis. Oh. <laughs> Let's pretend this never happened. Aiden, huh? Are you interested in the lieutenant chief? Of course not, sir. Fraternization is against regulations. What's up? You didn't come by to eavesdrop on family mail. Mm. <laughs> Mind your protocol. Nah, tell us about the fam. Your family seems to be important to you. Yeah, we've always been close. Me and my sisters especially. With dad on duty so much, I had to help mom raise them. Hmm, okay, you got a lot we can talk to you about here. Dad, let's start there. Did your father serve with the fleet? Yeah, took any crap posting he could get that offered space time. You know what? He worked his ass off trying to get recognized, but he never made it above serviceman third class. He was real proud when I made chief. First thing he did was salute. <laughs> That actually means that uh, you rose above his rank. I mean, I, or at least that seems to be the what you're implying there. I suppose I don't exactly know enough about military ranking to know definitively, but that seems to be what you're saying. What about your mother? What about your mother? You haven't mentioned her. You must know what military wives are like. Strong because they have to be able to raise kids while dad's away on a six-month cruise. She has a degree in planetary geology. That's she cool. both wanted to see new worlds. She gave up her career to raise us, though. That is quite a sacrifice indeed. Um, you... That was at least one sister who was just, uh, calling you before. Do you have numerous? 
Sisters, because I mean, this is saying sisters plural. You have more than one sister? Sounds like a big family. Yeah, I'm the oldest, then Abby, then Lynn. Sarah's the youngest, she's still in high school. With four girls, Dad used to say he felt more outnumbered at home than on maneuvers. All right, I see. Uh, what about home? Is, uh, is that Earth? Somewhere else? Where did you grow up? All over, same as you expect. We transferred a half a dozen times before I finished grade school. You go where personnel command sends you, right? I guess that's why I'm so tight with my sisters. We'd have to leave all our friends every two or three years. Well, that's good that you guys were, uh, you know, able to be supportive of one another in that case. Otherwise, that would have been tough, for sure. Probably still was, but uh, good to have that support system in place. I suppose, what, we were uh, a spacer, so to speak, ourselves, so it does in some ways sound familiar then. I was an only child, but I get the idea. At least one of my parents was always on duty. Also yeah. that. Military families, eh? With schedules like that, it's a wonder we ever have kids anymore. Things were tense between Sarah and me for a while. Then we bonded. Awkward phrasing. Also awkward phrasing. Let's embrace it. Embrace the awkwardness. Sounds like a story. Feel like sharing? Sarah got herself a boyfriend who wanted to go faster than she did. Mike. I didn't think he was a bad kid, just pushy. Lynn would send me these worried vid mails, and I'd tell her to relax. Vid mails? Where were you when this was going on? I was on active duty. Sarah's graduating high school this year. This was only a couple of years back. They were on Amaterasu. At the time, I was assigned to Chernobyl. Same cluster, but a dozen Hellwai away. Close enough to talk regularly, too far to make it back in an emergency. I couldn't afford a fast packet flight. Okay. I mean, if your sister said no, that means no. If he really liked her, he wouldn't be pushy. Yeah, of course. If he didn't ask at all, I'd wonder if he thought Sarah was ugly. <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mike thought they'd go for a romantic walk in the woods, because he figured it was past time they did the deed. She levered Mike face first into a tree and left. <laughs> didn't have a scratch on her. Good thing mom and dad had us all learn some kind of self-defense. I took emergency leave and walked Sarah to school for a few days. That was a good gesture. You traveled all the way home to walk your sister. That's true. A lot more than gesture, I suppose. A dozen light years, like a day's cruise. It's not like it was going to Earth or something. My last day out, Mike was waiting for us. Sarah had told her friends, so everyone at school knew what he did. He wasn't happy. I wanted to snap <laughs> him in half, but Sarah gave me this look. This, let me handle it. I need to do this alone look. She kept her cool, God bless her, as he screamed in her face. She just let him vent. Then he tried to punch her. I swear, she just flowed around him. Next thing I knew, he's face down on the sidewalk, and there's blood everywhere. <laughs> Take that. How's that for a knuckle sandwich? That's unbelievable. Sarah must be as good as you. Better. I'm more or less a straight-up puncher. When he swung, she just... She wasn't there anymore, and he fell. She helped him stop the bleeding and had me call an ambulance. She told the paramedics he fell. Before they took him to the hospital, Mike touched Sarah's arm. I thought he was going to end up on the ground again. <laughs> but he hung his head, whispered, I'm sorry, and started crying. She hugged him. The Williams women oh, one sec. bunch commander. We do things when we're ready. For a time to have out the game. After. Thank you. Do stuff when you're ready. You're a decisive bunch. You don't do it before then. Yeah, it was, you know, I suppose, interesting story. Lived up to the hype. Your sister's something else. But you didn't mention your father at all. Was he on deployment? My dad always wanted to serve in space. But he wanted us to have real ground under our feet. He'd say, space is beautiful, but you can't raise a family there. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly have suffered greatly, both with those that love me and alone. For always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known. Cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments. Or now. All right, we're done. No. Uh, it sounds like poetry. I never thought I'd hear you reciting poetry. 
Just because I can drill you between the eyes at 100 meters doesn't mean I can't like sensitive stuff. Just all right, all right. Not an accusation. This was my dad's favorite poem. Every time he shipped out, he recorded me reading it. He had a dozen versions when he retired. Hmm. Okay, okay. That is a good piece. Does he still like it? I sure hope so. I read it to his grave every time I go home. Dad passed on a few years back. He's probably still watching, though. From the afterlife? I suppose, what is this? Sort of like digging a little deeper and saying like, okay, so... The, uh... I don't know, Shepard. Religion is one of the topics you're not supposed to bring up. You mean from wherever we go after death? Dead on, Skipper. He's with God now. That's not a problem with you, is it? That I believe in God? So, uh, also, in case this wasn't, uh, apparent, yes, uh, this, the depth of conversation we are going in here does certainly start sending us on the path of romancing Ashley. Are we locked in at this stage? I, well, there, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see about that. But, uh, if things are starting to get a little heavy-handed in that way, then, uh, well, that's part of the reason why, is we are certainly, certainly at least headed down that direction. Um, so, I mean, we'll be supportive of her, I think, and generally just kind of nod our head and say, yeah, me too, and that type of thing, just to, uh, oh, well, yeah, keep her going for the time being. You know that old saw, there's never an atheist in a foxhole? I've been in a lot of foxholes. Yeah, guess you have. I've met a few people who were really weirded out by my faith. Because I work in space, I can't believe in a higher power. Jeez. Hello, have you people looked out the window? How can you look at this galaxy and not believe in something? I should get back to my duties. Didn't mean to take up so much of your time. Alright, well, in that case, that concludes probably the longest conversation we've ever had with Ashley. Dismiss, Chief. Sir. I don't know. That was like a... That was not just a sir. That was a sir. So yeah. I think that, uh, you know, things potentially starting to get a little serious with Ashley there, which is not necessarily my intention, so to speak. I'm not against it, per se, because, like I was talking about before, uh, my first two playthroughs of Mass Effect 1, both, first time I initially, I deliberately romanced Liara, second time I accidentally romanced Liara, so basically, at least for Mass Effect 1, my only objective from a, a romance standpoint is to not romance Liara. <laughs> Anything else is fine. It could be no one, it could be Ashley, it could be whatever, just as long as it's not Liara, it's fine with me. Let's, uh, hmm. While we're here, I think let's take a minute to just maybe even metagel our level one based items here. Things that are not going to be worth practically anything if we try to sell them at the moment. So we did use a somewhat significant amount of metagel not so long ago when we were uh, uh, repairing our Mako when we were fighting that Thresher Maw and that there's something else we were using it for. I mean, there's always the potential uh, metagel you could use to break through some of the crates and containers we tried to unlock. See, oh, actually, I may have just technically trashed that. Yeah, Omnigel is what I'm looking for. There we go. Convert to Omnigel. And again, I don't really know what qualifies as junk. Oh, or is it... Hold on. Now I'm curious. So we label it as junk, like so. And then... Now it has a little trash can here. These ones are the glowing trash can, where these are grayed out and not officially trash can. So if we Omnigel this, let's see. And we say convert all junk. Do we just lose three? I think so. I think so. So that was a risk, because I wasn't necessarily sure if we were just going to get, like, every single thing uh, <laughs> on a gel there. Because then we have a lot of things that, uh, you know, could in many ways be referred to as junk, yes. But, uh, you know, that is a convenient way to not have to, you know, like, open up the same menu every time. Or, yeah. I guess the same 
uh, menu, UI and what have you, every single time. So, uh, you know, we'll just like, mostly keep it to the level one stuff, I suppose. I mean, once you get to level two, it's still not very valuable, but it's at least worth something, so we could theoretically sell it. I think chest plates, for the most part, are a little bit more valuable, although even then, if we're still talking level one, that's probably not something that we're going to be making bank on, so to speak. So let's omnigel all this junk. Oh, I except I not press the for all junk button. So I'm curious, that dude just the chest plates that we marked as junk, or did it also get um, one shotgun, I think, that was level one? Maybe. Like, did it also convert junk from other categories, or was it just that chest plate? I think it was everything. It was, because I'm not really seeing any level one items anymore. But I think we succeeded in that sense, and okay. Yeah, that's definitely a good a good thing to have understood now. Especially if we accidentally press the turn all junk to Omnigel button and we're like, oh, what did we do? So, uh, we got like 50-ish, uh, maybe 40-ish Omnigel out of that. I forget exactly where we were when we started that process, but now let's just sell a few things to you. Looking for supplies? Uh, more let's like looking to got. sell supplies. You bet, Commander. Because I... Do you still think we have some things around here that are not going to be all that useful to us? So, one of the biggest factors with how valuable something is, is what level it is. So that's why I was saying, probably fine selling all of our level 1 gear, because here you see a weapon upgrade is currently, I believe, our most valuable item at 6,300. In fact, we have several things at that price, because, uh, well, they're all the level 5 stuff that we have. Actually, more valuable than a shotgun that's also level 5 and here you see these are both level 5 shotguns but this one is worth 5,250 whereas this one's just worth 4,200 the reason for that being is like we were talking about a bit before Haliat Armory is a relatively good manufacturer whereas the Hane Kadar however you say their name is not so their stuff is is cheap so I mean for the most part we can probably go, or at least we can start by going to the bottom and selling our lowest level stuff, our level two things for the most part. One thing you want to bear in mind, some types of upgrades in particular are only available at lower levels. So what that means is if you like some of the upgrades at lower levels, then later on in the game, it is going to become difficult in some cases, potentially even impossible to get more of them because you'll be a high enough level that you'll be getting only, you know, level seven, eight, nine stuff. And so the the good old level three or level six gear, which had different types of stats altogether, or at least in many cases, the lower level versions are just one stat but very specialized and technically if you're trying to maximize that one thing that is the way to go whereas as you start to get further along in the game you'll get like i said upgrades that have totally or at least a different array of stats sometimes you'll still have one of the stats that you previously had from lower level armor but that number will probably be lower than you would have gotten previously it's just that it's coming along with say three other things for example i Let's see, what's a theoretical thing we could do? Um, let's talk... I mean, this is may or may not actually be a, a real example of something we're going to see, but let's just say, for example, purpose... Uh, that we, we're, we're talking shields. Because we saw there were some low-level uh, upgrades that give 45, uh, 90 shields, and nine might, 90 might be the, the highest before it turns into something else. And then... If you want to maximize your shields, then maybe you want to have that 90 shields upgrade. But that's only available up to whatever. Maybe it's level 3 or 4. I forget where exactly the cutoff is. Um, I think it's maybe even 5. But um, at a certain point, you will that type of upgrade will no longer exist. Like, there is no 
level six pure shields upgrade. Once you do get to level six upgrades and beyond, there might be a sort of hybrid upgrade that is partially shields, maybe partially shield regeneration rates, and maybe also something like, uh, I don't know, cooldown recovery. We saw that on some stuff previously. And so each of those individual stats would be on the low-ish side, or at least start on the low-ish side, but collectively does make for a strong upgrade. But what that means is that if you only care about the shields, then you actually prefer the uh, the lower level one. Actually, the best the best example of this is uh, if we have any lying around here is actually the um, the wet uh, the ammo upgrades because if you care about pure damage from things like armor piercing rounds or actually we saw some tungsten rounds later on which are also just pure damage to uh, synthetic enemies then those are the types of ammos that you want however eventually as we get far enough along the game and we are only getting higher level loot to drop those will no longer be available and that is potentially problematic if you sell all of your old ones assuming that you're going to get more there may be a time when it seems like they're never ending but there will also be a time when they are no longer available to you so for that reason you want to be a little bit mindful in particular with those upgrades because uh you might miss some you might not be able to get some back if uh you do find yourself selling all of a certain kind especially ones like the armor piercing or uh shredder round which is the uh anti-organics basically the the humans and aliens version of the uh tungsten round which is the anti-robots uh damage so uh, that's the kind of thing that you could justify putting on just about any weapon it's a safe versatile relatively versatile if you're fighting the right type of enemies option so uh that one you, there's kind of there's never too many of those you can have but anyways bearing that in mind Let's just be mindful of those upgrades and focus instead, for the most part, I mean, there are some things like uh, Combat Sensor, which I think we had a lower level one as well. That one's just, it's bad at low levels. <laughs> so, also, for the most part, I mean, eh, we might find ourselves using it at some point. At some point, by necessity, I think we may even have it on on one of our existing weapons because we don't have any great alternatives. Like here we start getting into low level pistols, you know, dump those. Lots of, and so the, the different weapons have different values. Pistols on average are the cheapest. That's why we're seeing all the pistols at the bottom here. Then we actually get to, oh, some of the, the light armors, I think are going to be less valuable than the uh, medium armors, which are less valuable than the heavy armors, which perhaps makes some sense. So it looks like after the uh, the pistols, the next cheapest type of weapon is shotgun, as we're seeing here. All of our rank 2 or level 2 shotguns are now going up as our next cheapest. And uh, how much monies did we have at the beginning here? I think we had like 71,000-ish or just over 70,000. So we've gotten 3,000, maybe a little less than that. Which, I mean, it's not a ton right now, but probably still got a little bit more selling to do. So I, I think I may stop after we've sold all of our level 2 weapons, though, because at that stage... You know, we haven't looked at every single person and uh, tried to maximize their stuff collectively, or optimize their stuff collectively, because, um, you know, it's one thing if you just kind of pass around the best equipment like a torch or a baton and say, okay, well, Garrus are going on this mission, so let's make sure that Garrus has the best assault rifle. And we only actually need one great assault rifle as long as we only have one assault rifle use user at any given point in time. Uh, it can get a little awkward, 
making sure that you always have that assault rifle on hand, of course, in that case. But uh, it is doable. Whereas if you have multiple of them, then you can have, you know, a good assault rifle on all the potential assault rifle users and don't have to spend extra time in preparation setting people up. 